All right, let's go ahead and get started, shall we? Uh, welcome back, everybody, to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens, San Francisco Dharma Collective, uh, and tonight we're gonna keep our keep studying the Samyutta Nikaya. We're gonna keep looking at the section on the skandhas, but we're moving to. Oh no, no, we were we were in this section last time, or actually no, we're kind of moving to a new section. So we're moving to a little section still in the skandha section of the Samyutta Nikaya, but we're going to move to a, a section that's called flowers. And there's 10 little sutras in this section. And tonight we're going to read the sutta that is called the flowers sutta. So this is the Pupaha. Pupaha or in Sanskrit, it's Pushpaha Sutta or Sutra. And it's uh, number 94 of the Samyutta Nikaya. So section 22, Sutra number 94. I'm on page 949, if you happen to have this edition. And yeah, and we got a link to a translation. Um, otherwise, just a quick little background on this sutta before we go ahead and dive into it. So uh, some of the first Dharma Doors videos that are on the SFDC YouTube page, they're uh, the last few classes I gave in the old center uh, before the big shutdown. And the last few suttas that I was working on when we were still in the space together is from this section, actually. So if you go back, if you go way back in the archive, I did a whole night uh, on sutta number 95, which is the, the Fena sutta, the lump of foam. And that was part of like a longer, like I think it was maybe four or five classes I did. And it was all about these um, different Buddhist metaphors or similes. And so this was about how the skandhas, or at least the first of the skandhas, can be seen as like a lump of foam. Anyways, that sutta that we did so long ago, it's from the same section. And the kind of the through line, the thread that connects these 10 suttas is they're all still doing dealing with the skandhas, of course, but they're all suttas where the Buddha uses a kind of different metaphor or a simile to explain the aggregates. And tonight, the Pupa Sutta, the Flower Sutra, I think it's sort of almost like one of the most important of the early suttas because of the particular metaphor of the flowers. I won't say too much about that now. I kind of want to build up to it because it's at the end, but let's go ahead and dive in. This is a really interesting sutra, by the way. It It's going to give us a lot to talk about tonight. A lot of like subtle ideas in here. So let's go ahead and dive in. <clears throat> So, uh, Sutta 94, the flowers, also at Savati or Shravasti, the Buddha said, Bhikkhus, I do not dispute with the world. Rather, it is the world that disputes with me. A proponent of the Dharma does not dispute with anyone in the world. Of that which the wise in the world agree upon as not existing, I too say that that does not exist. And of that which the wise in the world agree upon existing, I too say that that exists. And what is it, bhikkhus? that the wise of the world agree upon as not existing, of which I too say does not exist? Form, rupa, 
that is permanent, stable, eternal, not subject to change. This the wise in the world agree upon as not existing, and I too say that that does not exist. Sensations that are permanent, stable, eternal, not subject to change. Perception that is permanent, stable, eternal, not subject to change. Conditioning that is permanent and stable. Consciousness that is permanent and stable. The wise of the world agree that those things do not exist. And I too say they do not exist. That bhikkhus is what the wise in the world agree upon as not existing, of which I too say that it does not exist. Let's, let's hold off and let's dive into that. And then we'll hear about what the wise of the world agree upon as existing that the Buddha too agrees upon existing. The first thing though, that I don't want to, I don't want it to slip by us too quickly. It's sort of the way that this sutra begins. And it's this really beautiful line, just a beautiful idea. A proponent of the Dharma does not dispute with anyone in the world. <laughs> I think that alone is worthy of contemplation. <laughs> A proponent of the Dharma. I'm for the Dharma. <laughs> I'm a proponent of the Dharma. And so the Buddha is telling me that if I'm a real proponent of the Dharma, then I don't dispute with anyone in the world. And indeed, that is kind of a state of being that is celebrated by the world of Buddhism. It goes by a few different names. It is basically about non-contention or non-dispute. And it's the idea that you reach a state where you no longer are contentious, you no longer dispute. And what I think is really interesting to think about and notice is why we do dispute. <laughs> why are we contentious? Why do we say, no, uh? <laughs> why do we argue? I think it's something interesting to look at. And what when I say look at, I actually, what I mean is to like look underneath and sort of think about, and, and this is like, this is true of tiny little disputes with maybe, you know, your loved ones, relatives and partner, you know, petty little, you know, I did the dishes last night kind of stuff, right? or arguing about bigger things, or arguing about the big stuff, right? Religion and politics and like the meaning of life. It's interesting to think about why, why, why am I arguing? <laughs> what, what, am I, what am I trying to do here with this argumentation? And of course, if you could look at it, it's sort of like, oh, I'm trying to get this person to think like me. Why aren't I willing to think like them? Huh. All kinds of things come to my mind in terms of looking at contention and looking at argumentation. And in particular, asking oneself, what's to gain here? And like, even if you could convince somebody... <laughs> which is rare, <laughs> so what, <laughs> right, you know, like, oh, I, I won, is that what we're going for, to like win, so again, I, tonight is not about that, but it is sort of like an underlying theme, sort of, so to speak, so I just wanted to put it out there, just something to think about, as always, just to examine contentiousness. It's a practice that I do because I can be rather argumentative. So, 
All right, but let's get into the Dharma in that sense. So the Buddha says this funny thing about the world, you know, the world disputes with me. I don't dispute with anybody, right? And because of the way this sutta is going to go tonight, there's a lot of interesting language that's going to be worked around. So what we want to know is the Buddha begins and says, bhikkhus, I do not dispute with the world. Rather, it is the world that disputes with me. So the word, the world that the Buddha doesn't dispute with, but disputes with him, the world is actually the sat, I mean, yeah, the sattva loka. So a sat, sattvas or you and you and I and all the creatures and the beings of the world are all beings, creatures, sattvas. And then a loka, L-O-K-A, it's where we get the English word local and location and locality. All those words that have to do with a location, a place, they come from this Sanskrit loka, and that is usually just translated as world. So the Buddha doesn't dispute with the sattva loka, the world of beings. This is the, I'm only stressing this because later we're going to come back to it. But it's, it's this sutra, it uses the word world in a few different ways. And the way it's translated is just world, world, world. But it's actually about how the Buddha doesn't dispute with people, the sattvas, the sattva loka, all right? Rather, it is the sattva loka that disputes with the Buddha. And then we have these two ideas that the wise of the world agree and that's, again, the wise of the sattva loka, the wise of the world, agree that form that is permanent, form that is stable, form that is eternal, and form that is not subject to change. Form like that, the wise of the world agree upon as not existing. And the Buddha says, and I too say that that does not exist. Now, this is going to go obviously for sensations, perception, conditioning, and consciousness as well. But let's think about it really quickly. The Buddha is saying that the wise of the world say that you, you won't find anywhere form that is permanent, stable. Now, what they're talking about, of course, is the aggregate of form, the body of rupa, the body of form. And the idea is, is, is any aspect of this body of form permanent, stable, eternal, not subject to change? And we could, by extension, <clears throat> apply it to all form. But I want us to remember that the Buddha is talking about the sentient subject, the sentient being, and the body of form, and saying that nobody in this world who's wise would say that there's form in this world that's permanent. Now, the thing about it that I find interesting, and I bring, I bring this up a lot, is that in modern Western physics, according to laws of thermodynamics, they too say that form is not permanent, that form is not eternal, that form is not stable, that it's changing in that way. So Western science physicists, they agree that form is not permanent. The last time I looked around, I haven't found any instance of form being permanent. So I agree with the Buddha. I agree with the wise of the world. There's not form that's permanent. Now, 
Of course, if you think about something like sensations, the idea of sensations being permanent, if sensations were permanent, you would be experiencing the same sensation forever. But you are not experiencing the same sensations you were a year ago, not even 10 minutes ago. So sensations are not permanent, stable, they're subject to change. The wise of the world say that, and the Buddha says that too. Perception, true as well. Conditioning, true as well. And then ultimately states of consciousness, are they're changing the quickest. They're changing thought moment to thought moment in that sense. So the wise of the world say none of that exists. The Buddha says none of that exists either. Do any of you think that form, sensation, perception, conditioning, or consciousness is permanent, eternal, not subject to change? I didn't think so. <laughs> right. Now, we're, nobody's really supposed to. Because no, who wants to be not wise, right? But of course, we all we all see that as being the case. This is where things get a little tricky, though. And what is it, bhikkhus, that the wise in the world agree upon as existing? of which I too say that it exists, form that is impermanent, suffering, and subject to change. This the wise in the world agree upon as existing, and I too say that it exists. Sensations that are impermanent, that are suffering and subject to change, yeah. The wise of the world say those exist. I too say those exist. Perception, conditioning, and consciousness that are impermanent, suffering, and subject to change. Yeah, the wise of the world say those exist, and I too say those exist. That, bhikkhus, is what the wise in the world agree upon as existing, of which I too say that it exists. All right, so the first thing that I want to mention is that this sutta at least sort of, yeah, this sutta, if you read all the footnotes, if you read all of Bhikkhu Bodhi's footnotes, this sutra is sort of famous. I don't want to say famous, but it is not well known because it's in, it's a supposedly it's an instance or a sutra where the Buddha does posit something as existing. So he says, yeah, there's all these things that don't exist, like permanent form, permanent sensations, and so on. And we are normally within the world of Buddhism, we are used to things being uh, what is known as apophatic apophatic is a really fancy word that i really like apophatic means always operating in the negative what what something isn't but never saying what it is so it's sort of like defining something by process of elimination by saying well it's not this it's not that it's not that that a technical way of describing that way of of discoursing is to say that's apophatic. Buddhism is rather like that, where it talks a lot about what things aren't, but rarely actually posits something in a way. And this is a sutra that's it's a rare occasion where the Buddha is positing existence. I have my own interpretation of that that I'm going to kind of share with you tonight, but I do want you to know that this sutra is contrasted with other sutras where the Buddha sort of emphatically denies the existence of anything. So let's kind of look at this very carefully. So the Buddha says again, so the wise in the world agree 
that form that is impermanent, suffering and subject to change. Yeah, that exists. The wise of the world say that exists. And the Buddha is saying, yeah, and I too say that exists. But what are what exactly are we, or the Buddha, what exactly is being asserted as existing? And this is where you we need to pay very close attention to the language. The Buddha is asserting the existence of impermanent form. So he's kind of, I mean, there's different ways to read that, of course. You could get kind of, and people do, by the way, get very philosophical about this. But that's a rather tricky way of talking about existence. And what I mean is, is the Buddha asserting the existence of form or the existence of impermanence? <laughs> you, we Again, we could probably spend all night sort of really parsing this out, but I find that the, I find this sutra a little tricky that when the Buddha is a saying, I, I too agree that that exists, for me, what I only the only thing I can really detect of the Buddha asserting existing is suffering in a certain way. I mean, yes, the principle of impermanence, but that's not an existent, meaning something that exists. To say that impermanence exists sort of means that it exists as a phenomena that happens. And then we get to the idea of impermanent form. So, you know, what is existent in that exactly? But the Buddha is saying that the wise of the world say that what exists is form that is impermanent, suffering, and subject to change. Now, with we could, again, we could get very philosophical about this and, and really start, you know, diving into that, but I don't think we really need to do that. My feeling about it is if you think about the formulation of the Four Noble Truths, I want to share this because I've, I've heard, I heard recently, I hear all the time, I hear all the time that I often hear the First Noble Truth as being taught or defined as life is suffering. But that's not the first noble truth. The Buddha, as far as I can tell, never said life is suffering. The Buddha said there is suffering. Or if you want to get kind of really technical, he seems to be saying that this is suffering. That, that is the way the Four Noble Truths, the language of the Four Noble Truths, the actual way it's worded is this is suffering. Or you could read it as there is suffering. But the idea that life is suffering is a very kind of modern American gloss. It's a very pessimistic gloss of the First Noble Truth to just say life is suffering. It, it it kind of paints it in a picture or paints it a way that it's really, I don't think misses the point. But the Buddha in the Four Noble Truths does seem to be asserting the existence in a sense of suffering in that way. That it, it there's something about it that is happening. And so there's that. There's the formulation of the Four Noble Truths, where the Buddha does seem to be asserting the existence of suffering. There's reading this as not talking about the existence of form, but talking about the existence of the impermanence of form, which is suffering. So that's sort of a way to read all of that. But I actually, if for me, I was thinking about this this afternoon. And if you pull way back, if you pull way back, I think what the Buddha is sort of basically saying, this is my interpretation of this part of the sutta. When 
when someone say, you know, we love and they pass away and we suffer as a result, the Buddha is saying, yeah, that happens. That's suffering. And I, I too agree that that is suffering. So meaning the impermanence of form and the suffering from the impermanence of form, the, that's real or that exists. The wise of the world say that that sucks. The wise of the world say that it sucks to get sick. I too, Buddha, I too say it sucks to get sick. So what I'm what the way that I read this is the Buddha is saying that the wise of the world say that what exists is impermanent form that causes suffering or that leads to suffering. And the Buddha saying, yeah, that's what I'm saying. I'm saying that too. Now, what, what you could insert, it isn't in the sutra, but what you could insert is anybody talking about the eternal pleasure derived from form. <laughs> no, no wise person in the world is saying that there is eternal pleasure being derived from form. So, but they don't, they're not talking about that. The Buddha is saying, no, the wise of the world say that impermanent form sucks. I say it sucks too. And the wise of the world says that impermanent form and sensations, that those don't exist, or permanent form and sensations don't exist. I say those don't exist either. So those are our kind of our options, at least in terms of the sutra. Those are our options regarding the skandhas, right? That they're either permanent, but nobody says they're permanent, or they're impermanent and a cause of suffering. And that's what the Buddha is saying, and that's what the wise of the world say. All right. So any questions about, this was a great time for any broad questions about the aggregates, any of this, these ideas. They doing Okay. Hmm. Maria. Hi, I had um, um, a point of clarification from last time, and I just want to get it out there real quick. So I ran across um, who's who in Dzogchen, and it's like a glossary, and it explained this really clearly. And it's, I heard, I re-listened to last time about. Oh, Marie, you dropped out for a second. Re just repeat that last part. Or not. Your bud was okay. turning okay. itself off. Um, <clears throat> so awareness is not mind because mind is, awareness isn't appropriating. And awareness is not, um, Consciousness, because consciousness is an aggregate, awareness is not an aggregate. So I wanted to just put that out there. But the thing about the Buddha talking about existence, the way it comes off to me is just that um, um, he's just saying that, that suffering exists in the same way that we exist or experience exists. And that is just that it's such, it is a thing that is a part of experience in a sort of suchness sort of way, um, sort of more of a conventional use of the word existence. Um, so. Mm -hmm. Yep, I would, I would read it that way for sure. Yep. Do you think that's a fair interpretation of awareness as different from mind and um, consciousness? So let's, let's just, for fun, for kicks, let's clarify all these different terms. So in general, you have three basic words in Buddhism that deal with thinking, thought, consciousness. <laughs> Those three words that we're going to be that you would find are chitta, manas, and vijnana. So let's start with vijnana. 
Vijnana is one of the aggregates, so it is one of the five skandhas. Vijnana is what is translated as consciousness, but what's really important to always keep in mind about Vijnana in Buddhism is that it is multifold. There is eye vijnana, ear vijnana, nose vijnana, tongue vijnana, bodily vijnana, and then brain vijnana. And then you actually, in more complicated Mahayana traditions, you have a seventh vijnana, a seventh kind of consciousness, which is called the adana consciousness, the appropriating consciousness, which is basically the self or the selfing aspect of consciousness. And then you have the eighth vijnana, the alaya vijnana, the elusive storehouse consciousness. But all forms of vijnana are subject object. All forms of vijnana are, are eyeball sensing object ear sensing object, tongue tasting object, brain thinking about object. So all forms of vijnana are dualistic, discriminatory, sensory awarenesses. Then there's manas. Manas is basically the function of the sixth sensory organ, what we call the brain, but the Buddhists call it the mind faculty, and manas, the job of manas is to stitch together the vijnana, the vijnanic impressions from the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and then sort of the brain, but manas is the thinker. Manas thinks about what was perceived by the vijnanas, plural. Then there's chitta. Chitta is what is properly translated as mind. Chitta is what can be diluted into thinking in terms of self. Chitta is what can be confused about the subject-object relationship. Chitta, and this is the, what I want to kind of get across regarding chitta. Chitta, as a as mind, they usually talk about two states of chitta. I forget exactly how to say it. It's chitta klesha something or something, but it is klesha, afflictions, you know, the, the three afflictions. So there is chitta that is affected by klesha. And so it is mind that is utterly corrupted by greed, anger, delusion of self, all of that. So there's mind that is corrupted. And then... There's bodhicitta, the awakened mind. You know, generating bodhicitta? Well, bodhicitta is the awakened chitta, not the defiled chitta. And this is what last week, at the end of last week, this is what I was saying, that this, hi, this is the mind that will be enlightened. But if this mind is thinking in terms of subject and object, then it is not enlightened yet. <laughs> but the point is, is that it is mind that will be enlightened or mind that is not enlightened. Mind that is not enlightened basically relies upon discriminatory vijnana consciousness to make decisions. The analogy that I'm always giving, by the way, oh, and by the way, this is not all for naught. This there's a lot of information happening right now that's totally going to come into the end of the sutra. But it's why I'm always using the dream state as an analogy. When I'm in a dream, but I don't know it's a dream, 
I think there's me and I think there's all the other stuff. And so my thinking, the thinking of the dreamer is predicated on the dream objects. Like, ooh, what's that over there? But when I do that in a dream and I go, ooh, what's that over there? What I've really done is reinforce the delusion that this is reality when it's actually a dream. But the way that I'm thinking in the dream is perpetuating the dream. If I'm relying upon discriminatory vinyanic consciousness to think, that's basically like being in a dream. If I don't do that, there can be an awakened state. And that's a lot like a lucid dream that is aware of the dream, but is not relying on the dream to think, but has transcended the dream in that way. And that's what we're actually going to get to tonight with the sutra. So does that all make sense, Maria, between chitta, manas, vinyana? Oh, cool. Yay. Yay. Yeah. So we really want to, from a Buddhist understanding, we really want to understand manas and vinyana as functioning. And we want to know how they function, but we kind of don't want to get too wrapped up in their functioning, if that makes sense. So. Okay, so on that note, unless there's any other questions from all that, cool. So now let's dig deeper because the sutra is about to go a step further. So that kind of concludes the first part of the sutra with this whole, uh, what the wise of the world say doesn't exist and what they say do exist. And I don't dispute with them about that. But then the Buddha says this, there is, bhikkhus, a world phenomenon in the world to which the Tathagata has awakened and broken through. Having done so, he explains it, teaches it, proclaims it, establishes it, discloses it, analyzes it, elucidates it. And what is that world phenomenon in the world to which the Tathagata has awakened and broken through? Form, bhikkhus, is a world phenomenon in the world to which the Tathagata has awakened and broken through. And having done so, he explains it and teaches it and so on. Uh, yeah, and then the end of that paragraph or the end of that idea is he teaches it, explains it. And when it is being thus explained and elucidated by the Tathagata, if anyone does not know it and see, how can I do anything with that foolish worldling, blind and sightless, who does not know and does not see? And of course, the same things are going to go for sensation, perception, conditioning, and consciousness. So what's going on in this paragraph? Bhikkhus, there is a world phenomenon in the world <laughs> to which the Tathagata has awakened and broken through. And what is that world phenomenon? It's rupa, form. <laughs> so... This is where the language starts to get very interesting. So the word, the term that is being used for a world phenomenon is a loka dharma. Now, we, of course, know the use of the word dharma in Buddhism, that it can it's a word that can just mean a thing and uh, anything, a dharma, or it can mean a principle or a law something to that effect. So this is a loka dharma, a worldly dharma or world phenomenon as they translate it. So there is bhikkhu a loka dharma in the world. 
So the technical thing that's being translated as in the world is the, well, in, in Sanskrit is the samskara loka. Sankara in, in Pali, the Sankara Loka. So Samskara is the fourth aggregate. You know, conditioning, habits. So, oh, and by the way, this language of world, you could also, because some people might be more familiar with this, you could translate this as realm as well. Like, for example, at the beginning of the sutra, the realm of sentient beings. It could be the, you know, the world of sentient beings, but it could be the realm of sentient beings. And then this could be the realm of samskara. So now let's look at this again. Bhikkhus. There is a loka dharma in the samskara loka. <laughs> which the Tathagata has awakened to and broken through. Form, Rupa, is a Loka Dharma in the Samskara Loka to which the Tathagata has awakened and broken through. So let's deal with Loka Dharma first. So form, and by the way, this is going to go for sensation, perception, conditioning, and consciousness. So those are going to be five loka dharmas, because the Buddha is going to say sensation is a loka dharma, but he's actually going to say that sensation, vedana, is a loka dharma in the samskara loka. And then what's really wild is he's going to say samskara is a loka dharma in the samskara loka. So let's try to unpack all of that. So the first thing to think about is what is this idea of a loka dharma? My understanding of that term is that in the early Buddhist tradition, and this remains true of all of Buddhism, there is this process, I don't, I don't know, I don't think I maybe should call it a process, but there is this thing in the world of Buddhism of reducing all of phenomenal existence, reducing it all down to a set of dharmas, a set of laws or principles that are, that are functioning, operative in the world. My understanding of the use of the term loka dharma in this sutra is the Buddha saying that form is one of those constituent elements of reality. Traditionally in Buddhism, there are 108 dharmas. There is there are varying lists, I need to tell you. So they're not they're not all as clean and neat as 108, but traditionally it has come down to that a certain list of 108 constituent elements of the phenomenal world. Form is one of those constituent elements of the world, along with sensations, perception, conditioning, and consciousness, greed, anger, delusion, and the, all of these other kind of, oh, and by the way, of the 108 dharmas, only a couple of them are physical. All the rest of them are what we would call emotions or psychological states. They are non-physical, but they nonetheless go to and contribute to the formation of the phenomenal world. You know what's not a loka dharma? You know, you know what is not a constituent element of reality that you will not find anywhere? The self. You will find clinging, because clinging is a dharma, clinging is a constituent element of reality, but you will never find the self as a loka dharma. 
So when the Buddha says that I have awakened to and broken through this Loka Dharma, my reading of that is he's saying these five things are constituent elements of the phenomenal world, but there's no self that's part of that at all in that way. Everybody okay with that kind of general reading of Loka Dharma? But now what does it mean when the Buddha says form is a Loka Dharma, a worldly phenomena in the samskara Loka? So he's the Buddha is definitely playing with language with this idea of the a Loka Dharma in the samskara Loka. But to say that form to say that form is a loka dharma in the samskara loka, the way that I understand that is that what I think of as, well, I'll give you the my classic example. <laughs> what, do you, what do you see? The form, the particular, are you seeing two faces or are you seeing a glass? Well, the particular form that you're experiencing is dependent upon your conditioning, is dependent upon your samskara. And so form, whether you're seeing faces or a glass, that particular form is in the samskara loka. It is in the realm of your conditioning in that way. Sensations are a loka dharma in the realm of your conditioning perception is a dharma in the realm of your conditioning your conditioning is conditioning in the realm of your conditioning and then consciousness is a dharma loka dharma in the realm of your conditioning this is all by the way this is all very um main line Mahayana Buddhism that turns into Yogacara Buddhism is exactly these ideas. So I would suggest noticing kind of super, super early Yogacara in this sutra. So, all right, questions so far, but I know that was a lot of different ideas about the world. Am I still hanging in there? All right. Um, yeah, okay, cool, let's do this. So after dealing with form, of course the Buddha says feeling or sensation, perception, conditioning, consciousness, those are all worldly phenomena in the world of samskara to which the Tathagata has awakened and broken through. Having done so, he explains it, teaches it, proclaims it, establishes it, discloses it, analyzes it, elucidates it. And then that little conclusion, and when it's being thus explained and elucidated, if anyone does not know or see, how can I do anything with that foolish world laying blind and sightless who does not know and does not see? So now I want to deal quickly with the Tathagata having awakened and broken through. So awakening, of course, that is the idea. That's the whole project here. It's called Buddhism for a reason, because it's about Buddha. It's about Bodhi awakening. So that's sort of what's going on here. But what does it mean that the Buddha has awakened and broken through these aggregates in that way. Well, if for me, if you go all the way back to kind of where this series on the Skandha sort of started, for me, it all started with those great series of poems by the nuns. And all of the nuns were describing their state of liberation and their state of liberation had to do with 
kind of disconnecting in that way from the aggregates. So my understanding of this idea of awakening and breaking through has to do with, or it not has to do with, it is, as my understanding, it's about the default mode of mind and the default mode of mind, because mind is so clingy as we realize it, it's in the business of doing that. And so mind has this tendency of appropriating clinging to the aggregates. This is what we've been studying for weeks and weeks and weeks now. Mind totally has a habit of clinging to the body of form, to sensations, to perception, to conditioning, and to consciousness. And let's remember the key phrase. The key phrase is this one about regarding, regarding form as self or regarding the self as in form or form as having self or self as having form. Do you remember we did a whole sutra where the Buddha worked through these four options about the self being in form or attached to form, all these different ideas. And the end of that was, and the noble disciple doesn't do that. And then we read a sutra about, well, what's, what's the problem? What's the problem with appropriating and identifying with the body? And the sutra told us, the problem is, is that when you do that, Every single time the body changes or sensations change or perception changes or conditioning changes or consciousness changes, you freak out about it. <laughs> Every time a part of this changes, you get all worked up and suffer because you're clinging to the old configuration of the skandhas as self. And then the skandhas do what skandhas is going to do which is they change. And then when the body changes, when sensations change, perception, condition, consciousness change, we get all freaked out. And so the Buddha's talking about a state of mind that is not appropriating and identifying with the aggregates. And that state of mind, as we learned, maybe this was last week, that state of mind approaches the skandhas like it does a pile of dirt across the street as no more the self than as that pile of dirt or pile of grass across the street. A mind that is in such a state in relationship to the aggregates, that mind is liberated. That mind is free. That mind has no fear because that mind would not fear dying because it does not identify with the corpse that is the five aggregates. So everybody follow me on the kind of that big overview of what's kind of going on here with the aggregates. Cool. So the one thing that I want, would love to remind you of is this language of the Tathagata, the thus come one, so I always like to remind everybody that, you know, yes, the Tathagata is one of the titles of a Buddha. We've got uh, Bhagavat, World Honored One. We've got Arahat, Worthy One. We've got uh, Sugata, the Well Gone One. We've got Buddha, the Awakened One. These are all different titles for a awakened being or a Buddha. And then we have this title called a tath Tathagata. And my understanding of Tathagata is, all, is this. It actually, it's right here in the sutra. So let's say, let's say that I'm not enlightened, which I'm not. And what that means is, is that I identify with this body. I still do, definitely as a matter of habit. 
And so there's a way in which I identify as Michael, the Dharma teacher dude, and what have you, right? I often mention that I identify as being a married Dharma teacher dude. And, you know, the identifications go on and on and on, right? But notice that mind, the mind, identifying with the aggregates, mind in that sense now has a gender, mind now has an occupation, mind now has a marital status, mind now has all of these lakshana characteristics to it in that way by identifying with the aggregates. What I want us to think about is what about a mind that doesn't identify and appropriate the aggregates? How would we understand such a being? Could we even call it a being? Well, for lack of a better term, we could describe such a being as thus. As, as such, as so, as Tathagata. So for me, because I'm more of a Mahayana Buddhist in that way, rather than thinking of Tathagata as just another name for the Buddha, I would strongly encourage thinking of Tathagata as the word for that indescribable being. And the thing, the reason why I'm stressing it this way is because I'm more of a Mahayana Buddhist, I kind of believe in Buddha nature, as it might be called. And so I believe in all sentient beings' ability to not be attached to the aggregates and to thus, to thus be thus. So because I have that feeling about Buddha nature and all beings' eventual awakening, I like to think about Tathagata as that state of an awakened being, not as just another name for the Buddha. Because for me, if it's just another name for the Buddha, then good for the Buddha. <laughs> but what about what's, what about me in that way? Meaning that it, it's sort of, um, I'm not the type of Buddhist that just bows down to the Buddha in that way. So that's my little spiel about Tathagata. All right, so perfect timing, unless there's any, for some reason, questions about Tathagata. All right, so we made it to the end of the sutta where the Buddha says this. I wonder if that's the wrong sutta. I was like, how did Rahula get in this sutra all of a sudden? And so after all of that about the Tathagata has awakened and broken through broken through what form, sensation, perception, conditioning, and consciousness. This is the way that this sutra ends. Bhikkhus. Just as a blue, red, or white lotus is born in the water and grows up in the water, but having risen above the water, it stands unsullied by the water. So too, the Tathagata, was born in the world and grew up in the world, but having overcome the world, he dwells unsullied by the world. So that, of course, is the flowers, the lotus flowers. So that's where the title of the sutra comes from and the title of this particular section of ten, these 10 little sutras. So this, of course, is a very, very famous Buddhist simile. This comparison to the lotus flower that begins its life in the water. Usually when people talk about this metaphor, they talk about the mud that a lotus flower begins its life in the mud, grows up in the mud, but then it eventually transcends the mud of the pond 
and blossoms unsullied by the pond. And that is the overarching metaphor for Buddhism, which is that we are born in the aggregates, we grow up in the aggregates, but to awaken is to transcend the aggregates. So that idea right there, the idea of transcending the aggregates as being like a lotus flower that begins its life in the mud of the pond, but then transcends it and blossoms outside of the pond. That, again, that's the overarching metaphor of Buddhism. And I say that because, and I was trying to find one, I don't have a lot of good art books, I need better art books. But of course, I know that you've seen it, which is the image of the Buddha on the lotus flower. It is the classic Buddhist image, that image of a meditating Buddha sitting on a lotus flower. And I want you to know that that image of a Buddha on a lotus flower, it ultimately comes from this sutra. Now, the metaphor of the lotus flowers appears in a few sutras, but to my knowledge, this is the like original flowers sutra in that way. And so that metaphor of, of in Buddhism of basically flower children, for lack of a better term, but that idea of awakening, bodhi, of being like a lotus flower. What off so often, hold on, buddy, I'm coming. <laughs> so what is often kind of noted about the lotus flower metaphor is it's this idea of like, it's it's almost kind of often used as a metaphor for a spiritual, any kind of spiritual practice. And the idea is, is that there's the world of like materiality, right? The world of, of commerce and, you know, the world. And then there's like, the spiritual realm with like, I don't know, crystals or something. But there's that idea of like the spiritual versus the mundane. And so often the lotus flower metaphor is used to talk about, we begin like as children in the world at the mall, at the arcade. But then if I develop a spiritual practice, I sort of transcend that world and then sort of you know i don't know be, you know become enlightened not in that world and yeah i that's that's a fine metaphor especially if it's upayak in encouraging somebody to start you know a practice then it's awesome but what i think is really important if if you look at this whole sutra very carefully it's pretty clear to me that the water, the mud, the pond is not just the world, it's the aggregates. This whole sutra is about the aggregates and about the Buddha breaking through the aggregates. And then he ends the whole sutra with, yeah, it's like a lotus flower. <laughs> so my feeling about the lotus transcending the pond is that it's about this mind we've been talking about tonight transcending the mud of the identifying and clinging to the five aggregates and then this liberated mind that is not doing that in that way so questions comments answers ideas about the lotus metaphor the sutra as a whole because that's pretty much it hmm no I'm wondering um, what the significance is of the of the realm being called the realm of of conditioning. No, no, it's not. It's not like shorthand for all the aggregates. It's the realm of conditioning. I mean, I have my own ideas, but I'd love to hear. Hmm. Yeah, and I did. I actually, I did want you to know the last. A paragraph that's about the lotuses when it says that so too 
The Tathagata was born in the world, but that is not the Sattva Loka. It's a different Loka, and it, it's the Okasa Loka, which my understanding is it's about literally a birthplace, like a, a, a location of birth. So, so too, just like a lotus flower. The Tathagata was born in the world and grew up in the world, but having overcome the world, he dwells unsullied by the samskara loka. So the very last line is, he dwells unsullied by the realm of samskara. So this is where I said that you could almost read this as an early Yogacara Sutra, because the basic teaching of the Yogacara tradition, the mind-only tradition, is the idea that all phenomenal reality, all reality, everything, is fabricated from consciousness or mind in that way. And where does all of that fabrication come from? Conditioning. Just like in a dream. Where does all the dream stuff come from? It comes from the, quote, recesses of your mind, the recesses of your subconscious. But in Buddhism, the recesses of your mind, the recesses of your subconscious, that's your conditioning. That's the aggregate of, sams of samskara. Now, the way that I understand that, Noam, in terms of what, it, what would it mean to be unsullied by the realm of samskara? Well, a very simple example, super simple, it's like kind of the most basic up here. For me, one of the most basic examples of being sullied by samskara or the realm of samskara is well basic i mean all kinds of prejudice but racial prejudice sexual prejudice any kind of prejudice is totally being sullied by samskara because what you're doing is is if you meet somebody and you are judging them or prejudging them based upon some other experience you had with some other person, <laughs> then you are utterly projecting your samskara onto this poor person <laughs> in that way. And so that's utterly a sullied mind. Whereas to be unsullied by samskara would to be actually to encounter each sentient being as that sentient being. And ultimately, not up here at being like, you know, um, racially discriminatory or racially prejudiced, but you can go down another rung. And that's about the idea of like putting all, putting all cats in the same category of cats and being like, oh, I've, I've seen a cat before. I know all about cats. That's being sullied by samskara, where we're not actually able to see what's right in front of us because it's being passed through the filter of our samskara. That for me is, is the Buddhist project of not having that filter or overlaying of past experience. Now, this doesn't mean, of course, that we don't learn from past experience. Obviously, we learn, we grow, we develop. But it's a form of ignorance or a form of delusion to think that I know this person because of what happened with that person. That's delusional in that way. So that's my understanding of the unsullied by the realm of samskara in that way. Mm -hmm. Cool. So really quickly, I'm, I was hoping we'd have just a little bit of time for this. Really quickly, because it's sort of like right in line with this series. It's only going to take a second, but I would love to share with you, though, because you might not have heard it. You might not have watched it. You might not want to watch it. But I want to read to you a little bit from that lump of foam 
sutra. It's just more kind of metaphors about the skandhas. And I probably won't have an opportunity to read this one for an, another couple of years. So really quickly, on one occasion, the Blessed One was dwelling at Ayodhya on the bank of the river Ganges. There the Blessed One addressed the bhikkhus thus. Bhikkhus, suppose that this river Ganges was carrying along a great lump of foam. Someone with good eyesight would inspect it, ponder it, and carefully investigate it. And it, and it would appear to them to be void, hollow, insubstantial. For what substance could there be in a lump of foam? So too, bhikkhus, whatever kind of form there is in the world, whether past form, future form, or present form, internal form, external form, gross form, subtle form, inferior, superior, far or near. A bhikkhu inspects it, ponders it, and carefully investigates it. And it would appear to the bhikkhu to be void, to be hollow, to be insubstantial. For what substance could there be in form? Suppose, bhikkhus, that in the autumn, when it is raining and big drops are falling, a bubble arises and bursts on the surface of the water. Someone with good sight would inspect it, ponder it, and carefully investigate it, and it would appear to them to be void, hollow, insubstantial. For what substance could there be in a water bubble? So too, bhikkhus, whatever kind of sensations there are, past, future, present, internal sensations, external sensations, gross sensations, subtle sensations, inferior, superior, far or near. A bhikkhu inspects those sensations, ponders them, and carefully investigates them. And it would appear to the bhikkhu that they are void, hollow, insubstantial. For what substance could there be in a sensation? Suppose, bhikkhus, that in the last month of the hot season, at high noon, a shimmering water mirage appears. Someone with good sight would inspect it, ponder it, and carefully investigate it. And it would appear to them to be void, hollow, insubstantial. For what substance could there be in a mirage? So too, bhikkhus, whatever kind of perception there is, whether past, future, or present, internal or external, gross or subtle, inferior or superior, far or near, a bhikkhu inspects it, ponders it, and carefully investigates it. And it would appear that, to them to be void, hollow, insubstantial. For what substance could there be in perception? Suppose, bhikkhus, that someone needs heartwood, seeking heartwood, wandering in search of heartwood, would take a sharp axe and enter a forest. There they would see the trunk of a large plantain tree, straight, fresh, without a fruit bud core. They would cut it down at the root cut off the crown, and unroll the coil. As they unroll the coil, they would not find even soft wood, let alone hard wood. Someone with good sight would inspect it, ponder it, and carefully investigate it, and it would appear to them to be void, hollow, insubstantial. For what substance could there be in the trunk of a plantain tree? So too, bhikkhus, whatever kind of samskara there is, 
whether past, future, present, internal, external, gross or subtle, inferior, superior, far or near, a bhikkhu inspects that samskara, ponders that samskara, and carefully investigates it. As they investigate, samskara appears to them to be void, hollow, insubstantial. For what substance could there be in samskara? Suppose, bhikkhus, that a magician or a magician's apprentice would display a magical illusion at the crossroads. Someone with good sight would inspect it, ponder it, and carefully investigate it, and it would appear to them to be void, hollow, insubstantial. For what substance could there be in a magical illusion? So too, bhikkhus, whatever kind of consciousness there is, whether past, future, or present, internal, external, gross or subtle, inferior, superior, far or near. A bhikkhu inspects it, ponders it, and carefully investigates it. And that consciousness would appear to them to be void, hollow, insubstantial. For what substance could there be in consciousness? Seeing thus, bhikkhus, the instructed noble disciple experiences revulsion towards form, revulsion towards sensations, perception, conditioning, and consciousness. Experiencing revulsion, one becomes dispassionate. Through dispassion, the mind is liberated. When it is liberated, there comes the knowledge. It's liberated. <laughs> and one understands. Destroyed is birth. The holy life has been led. What had to be done has been done. There's no more for this state of being. This is what the Blessed One said. Well, I actually have time. So there's just a little poem at the end, the end poem. This is what the Blessed One said. And having said this, the fortunate one, the teacher, further said, form is like a lump of foam. Sensations are like a water bubble. Perception is like a mirage. Samskara conditioning is like a plantain trunk. And consciousness is like an illusion. So explained, the kinsman of the sun. However one may ponder it and carefully investigate it, it appears to be hollow and void when one views it carefully. With reference to this body, the one of broad wisdom has taught that with the abandoning of three things, one sees this form discarded. When vitality, heat, and consciousness depart from this physical body, then it lies there, cast away. Food for other beings, without volition. Such is this continuum, this illusion, the beguiler of fools. This is taught to be a murderer. Here, no substance can be found. A bhikkhu with energy aroused should look upon the aggregates thus, whether by day or by night, comprehending, ever mindful. They should discard all the fetters and make a refuge for themselves. Let them fare as with their head, let them fare as if their head is on fire, yearning for the imperishable state. All right. So, just a beautiful little sutra. Just more food for thought. Any questions from that last little sutra, though? Can come up. It's pretty straightforward, right? If, if you didn't know, a plantain is basically a grass. So it just rolls upon itself and doesn't actually have a core like a tree does. That's what that metaphor is. So that Buddha often refers to. The plantain tree is a good example of something that doesn't have a essence or a core, just like a bubble. So. 
All right, everybody. Let's call it a night then, shall we? That'll conclude both the flowers and the lump of foam sutra. So, all right. Oh, uh, really quick, by the way, everybody, um, I'm going to be teaching, kind of holding, I guess you should say, I'm going to be holding a meditation workshop. Uh, that's through my own Lotus Underground school. Uh, and that's going to be next month in November, starting November 7th. It's a four night, uh, so four Tuesday nights in a row. And it's a, a workshop on the four foundations of mindfulness. So it's kind of one of my, oh, I haven't taught meditation for a while, like kind of formal meditation class. So I wanted to do that. So that's going to be on Tuesday nights, 6 to 7.30, starting next month on the 7th. And as usual, you can go to my website, lotusunderground.com, if you want to find out more about that, or perhaps register. So.